Okay, this Corne session is about Corne Council, and I'm using this little booklet, um, Competent to Council by J.E. Adams, published by Zondervan. Anyway, you know, this book's like 1970 or something like that. It's great. Um, I like the structure of it. Yeah, 1970. Anyway, so it's been a while back. So if some of the stuff in it sounds a little different, it's not anything I'd be proud of. I'd like to know that, uh, you know, since 1970, uh, churches are still uh, able to address the truth and counsel. And uh, it's from a uh, course that emphasized what's called neuthetic counseling. And that's a word in Koine from mind and thetic from positioning. So we're mentally positioning someone. And young people especially, you know the illustration in the Bible is there's a broad way and it says there's many that find it and it's just covered with people, many, 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 many people. And it says it leads to destruction. Destruction. Now, there's a there's an interesting thing in middle voice and in also in deponent verbs, which you don't have to look that up, but it has the idea of self in it. Self. And you can't really separate it. Self-destruction. And then, of course, it's passive also, meaning... Uh, to be destroyed. you be destroyed, meaning it'll happen to you. So, this is the aim of all counseling, is to mentally position each other onto this narrow that leads to life. Now, when you think of narrow, don't think of that necessarily as negative as much as it's similar to a very one-lane road. You don't need a four-lane highway with so little traffic. Uh, it's narrow. It's really it, it idea here in the context. It's specific. We have a specific path. Jesus is our shepherd. Didn't give us a vague and ambiguous broad, which you need to really think about that and be aware of stuff. But one thing I want to talk about is camouflage, and it's very popular today. Um, I've often used the phrase uh, "dust cloud," where people kick up a lot of dust and anything but repent and other if you don't repent under correction you usually resent and what's disappointing about it is so many people choose and you find out they resent correction rather than repent and that actually reveals their character but the account I want to cover very briefly is one that has been very helpful to me I use it often uh, even if it's in the entire congregational setting or if it's in a a group or if there's a small group forms in the church and we have to um, invite them to come back over and join the purpose for which we're there which is to carry out the Great Commission to make disciples not make divisions to uh, build up and edify the body to raise up our children nurture and admonition of the Lord for husbands to love their wives like Christ loved the church for wives to submit themselves to their husbands the way the church submits herself to Christ for older women to teach younger women to love their husbands, for children to obey their parents in the Lord, for fathers not to rage alongside their sons and daughters and exasperate them. Uh, the list could go on and on, but it's very specific, that narrow way. And just to give you an example in this new thetic, which is often thought of as the idea of confrontational, but really you're, you're mentally positioning someone and Parents especially want to always mentally position our children back on the path. And it's very popular, the prodigal son story, but it's very seldom the practice to see people go out and actually bring people back out from that condition. And knowing that even children of God can be in that condition at times, that we're looking for them to bring them back onto that sp specific path because outside of it, that is literally outside of a New Testament church, for example, an assembly, a congregation, who's there covenant together with the commandments as their um, rule of faith and practice and the covenant as the context of those commandments and that structure we have. There's no way for a young man or woman today to be conformed to the image of God in some virtual world out there. And that's why if someone asks me about the universal, invisible, or visible church concepts it's similar to what I respond and say what about the universal invisible visible invisible universal heaven or hell concept I don't know what the purpose is if we're not in a personal relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ we don't covenant together 
uh, the outcome is never achieved by anything virtual. So I don't really like the word universal, visible, or invisible. I more or less just use the word virtual. Uh, and you're not going to raise children in a virtual church. You're not going to conform people to the image of Christ that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You're not going to see people grow up to the full measure of the stature of Christ in a virtual church. Uh, but one of the ploys is uh, an account was given and this young lady was approached and of course this is in 1970 so you can only see today how uh, it'd be difficult to even find someone call in a pastor uh, especially if he's going to speak to someone because you know finding people even with the character to be approached by a pastor who's a teacher I know I know people that stay far away from me especially knowing that I know so much about the Bible because I've been taught by so many older people who went before me. Even my professors in the early 80s were, or late 80s were very uh, mature gentlemen when I first went to seminary. And I was old enough, 25, when I started that school. And it's the oldest Bible college in the state of Arkansas. And it is not a school that indoctrinates us. It educates us and teaches us how to use the language, use the tools of the scripture use the context, follow the hermeneutics, because in doing so, it develops us. And when you teach and structure the approach, and then you see that, like for example, predestination is into adoption, that full-grown son place, not leaving people as just immature children, but the destination is unto or into a full-grown son. There's no way to get there. That's why it was written to a church in Rome, because only in a church will that destiny be realized. Now, if you find someone, young people and parents especially, if you find someone that makes predestination some virtual uh, galactic destiny that someday when this life's over with, you'll end up somewhere in heaven, uh, you'll find someone that has not even come close to even reading the Bible, much more uh, thinking about it. And if you find someone that takes the doctrine, let's say, of election and voids it of purpose and that purpose being very definite in the book of Ephesians, for example, and it doesn't include what the Bible says in Ephesians about a, the faithful ones there in that particular place being built up together as a temple, a household of God in which he gets glory, receives glory, and in which we grow up in the full measure of the stature of Christ, in which fathers do raise their children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord, where children do obey their parents, wives do submit to their husbands, husbands do love the wife but like Christ loved the church, then you're probably not talking about anything about election that's in the scriptures. You're probably talking about an abstract virtual concept that only results in when this life's finally over, you'll be in heaven. And what's strange about it is they're voiding the very thing in between which all parents are concerned the most about grandparent especially that I am uh, my sons can't come to me and say dad don't worry I'm still going to heaven no they they will always be expected to be faithful to their wives faithful to the Lord in this church faithful to uphold the profession they made in baptism to commune every month faithfully in to the gospel and in remembrance of Jesus as the Bible makes it very clear and to grow in the measure, full measure of the stature of Christ, to continue to be in the process of being conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, if my kids just walk around and say they're somehow virtually, they're just the chosen ones, if somehow that's some privilege or prestige, I'll know that that's an attitude that doesn't exemplify the mind of Christ, uh, the heart of God, the Spirit of God, the heart of flesh, nor the new covenant. So I think I preached a sermon just then. But anyway, for those poor souls out there who didn't come to this site for this council, uh, this is for parents especially to understand why your child might do this, uh, present this in a situation. So here was a girl that was involved and she's a young lady and she was married. And yes, you'll be their parents after they're married also. And uh, But it's a good principle. Uh, they confronted her because she was being unfaithful with her husband. And uh, the ploy was, it says, I'll drown you out. So as they spoke, she continued to increase the volume so that you'll stop bothering me. But it says as soon as the counselors began to put their finger on the real issue in Mary's life, she began to howl and cry and scream and at the top of her lungs, besides um, inarticulate sobbing, she cried, leave me alone, leave me alone. Well, that's camouflage. And what you, this council says for is to help you push through the camouflage, peel it back and persist because when you get to the camouflage, you're just one step away from where you want to be as a parent 
or as a pastor or as a Sunday school teacher with the youth working with. And you're just really close. Um, so when you get to the camouflage, know that you're just about there. You're at the fence, the final wall of defense. And it says in the past, uh, this young lady had successfully warded off all attempts by her parents and others, which would be family members or pastors, to discover the reasons for her distress. And this camouflage and this smoke and this outlandish behavior, increased volume, sobbing, pouting, whatever all was described here, it, it drove those people away. But now she was using again her tried and true ruse with these particular counselors who, that's why we train to recognize where we're at so that when I'm involved in a, with, a, with a situation with a family, Usually I see them ready to just back away and retreat when this camouflage comes up. But when I'm there, I'm trying to get to this camouflage as soon as possible. So then the time I invest in the, uh, well, I'll call it the confrontation, is to penetrate that and get past that. I don't want to spend a lot of time and hours to finally get them to wail out and to uh, resent rather than repent. I want to bring them to resentment if that's the direction they're going or to repentance as quickly as possible. But when this comes up, camouflage, I know resentment is what's being harbored. So, parents, don't be discouraged. It says they these, these particular counselors look Mary squarely in the eye, it says, and Mary is just the name of the account. But it says, be quiet. And they went in and told her just to be quiet. And they told her, unless you stop this kind of nonsense and get down to business, we can't, we simply can't help you. So they went ahead and told her, surely a young girl like you doesn't want to spend the rest of her life in this institution. Well, she had actually been, at that time, uh, sent away, as it says, an institution so that she could be treated. Well, it says here in principle, instead of, of showing her sympathy, instead of responding to her tears, instead of being taken in by Mary's tactics, it says the counselors brushed aside the camouflage and pursued a straight course directly to the heart of the matter. So parents... The advice is to understand that anytime our children move from the narrow, the narrow, which is very specific, I just told you, there's a very broad, abstract philosophical concept out there, even among Christians, about predestination, election, uh, adoption. They just, they just make it some of the most abstract things you've ever heard of. But now if you're trying to raise a child and conform one in a process that's specific and the teachings of Jesus are actually tangible, usable, demonstrable teachings, such as we should teach our children not to pretend to be offended and go out and tell all their friends before they go and talk to the poor soul or friend of theirs that they happen to be accusing that of. We need to teach our children don't be hypocrites. We need to warn them of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. We need to teach them that Zacchaeus was not just a wee little man who climbed up a tree, but that he came out of the tree and made restitution. And that doctrine's in the Bible for our children to learn early in life that when you do something, uh, you make restitution for it. And that does include uh, monetary things. Because I do understand why people resent restitution because it involves money. Why they resent uh, correcting their own behavior when they're confronted is more than likely they're not a child of God. But anytime our children move this direction, we want to neuthetically, that is mentally, place them and position them back here because this direction is life. And to keep it simple, I'll just make it here. This is death. And in this lifetime, it's death, for example, the prodigal son while he was in the pig pen. He wasn't about to be a father. He wasn't about to be a husband. He wasn't about to be a head of a household. Uh, he wasn't uh, acquiring experience that would give him better skill sets to be the master of the house that the father was anticipating uh, to one day have his sons have the house and manage the entire inheritance. Because think of the irony of that story is you have one son who resents his father, can't wait on him to die to get the inheritance. The other one, the same thing, resents his father, can't wait on him to die. So he just says, let me cash out and get on with my life. When both of them were being in the household, as the book of Galatians says, Although heirs of all things, they were in the house as slaves, learning the rudimentary processes and development necessary for them to become headmasters of the house. And today, if you want to talk about adoption or you want to talk about predestination, which is into adoption, 
and you want to just have a philosophical conversation, uh, you can find all types of people. And, and I'm, what I've learned about the Internet now, they're all out there talking about these abstract ideas and philosophies, and they don't even know the difference, most of them, from what I'm well qualified to discern and distinguish. They don't know the difference between philosophy and the Corne text. So, parents, you want to get to this point as soon as possible because behind this camouflage is the problem. And that's where your opportunity is. So if your child is involved in something, let's say, abuse of uh, drugs or irresponsible with alcohol or is now associating with friends that will lead them back onto this Broadway and you want to bring them back, uh, for example, can they really afford to be backslidden, which we'll talk about that in another lesson. But people take backsliding very uh, too trite today. They're much too trite about it. Flip it. Uh, what if your child is in a backslidden stage um, when they're at the moment of de making decisions about their education. What are you going to do? Well, it's time to educate your child, and they're backslidden. Well, they may struggle with that the rest of their lives. Uh, what if they are in a backslidden condition when it's time to choose a, a life mate? Well, that could l they could live with that consequence the rest of their lives. So when is backslidden uh, first before we worry about defining the term? When you hear people, especially the modern, postmodern teachers, they talk about backsliding and just allow the audience to assign meaning to it. Um, my concern is not in backsliding. My children might be out overeating at some all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, what if your child's backsliding when they're around uh, evil companions? Uh, evil companions. And these evil companions... Uh, may make it home the next day after all night going out doing things they shouldn't do. Uh, but you may have to go to the morgue and identify your child. And you say, well, they were backslidden at the time. Well, you need to find out at what time in their life and spiritual development are they backslidden because um, if my children backslide, it should be that they come and tell me, Dad, I really didn't read my Bible much this week. But it won't ever be acceptable for my children to say, well, I'm backslidden. That's why I'm abusing my wife neglecting my children, neglecting worship, not serving Christ in the church, not leading the young people, not teaching them to do the same thing that you taught us to do. So, long story short is get to the camouflage as fast as possible to get the issue of resentment to emerge or repentance to emerge. But notice this, until you confront the smoke, the camouflage, and until you understand that's what to expect, You'll, you'll never get to the other side, which is where you want to go is to repentance. And resentment may just be momentary. They may only sustain this camouflage for a few moments, and prayerfully they show the character of Christ and repent. If they sustain this, then you start over and begin to treat your child or your friend or your fellow member in the congregation as a person who's a non-believer, and then you begin to preach the gospel to them you begin to invite them to gospel events. You leave tracts for them, have church members mail them uh, tracts about salvation. Because backsliding can, whatever people are talking about, if it's during a time of your life or your education or your life mate or evil associations or bringing a child into the world, uh, backsliding can become exponentially a problem. And anytime you're off the narrow way, you're on your way to death, and a lot will happen to you while you're on it, from which you may not recover. So young people, that's enough. Parents especially use this to um, equip yourself to know what you're dealing with and to be able to move past it. Don't fall for their camouflage. Don't become fatigued because mentally, when you're aware of what's going on and you're trained as we are as Koine Christians and as we are as long-time lifetime members in the same congregation where we've grown so much that we see right through it. Now that may hurt people in your church who want to come in and bring the broad way into the church and move the entire church there, uh, but they won't find themselves very successful with a well-trained, well-discipled, faithful, devoted church that has the love of Christ compelling us as ours does. Uh, we don't have deacons that play camouflage which is to really hide something in their life or their home where they're not leading as the Bible says they should. Uh, we don't have Sunday school teachers with generating issues and then camouflaging that with uh, to cover up where they're failing or refusing to walk with Christ in their own personal life. Uh, we don't have pastors or staff members that 
uh, will emit this or use this deploy camouflage to cover up their own infidelity in the office that they've been ordained or in the responsibilities they've been assigned. I've seen people who would be a committee chair or assigned a job in the church and they wouldn't do the job but they'd have all this camouflage and resentment when the church would expect them to do it. So more importantly though is the individual lives of our children and our relationships as brothers in Christ. Enjoy the study.